Good afternoon and welcome to the Freedom to Buy podcast presented each week by Supernet. I'm Joe Dworsky, the president for retail banking for Supernet, which is the only payment network building the rails for credit card payments for today's cannabis industry. Each week, our podcast will take you behind the scenes of banking, finance, payments, and technology to help educate our listeners on how to make the most of your purchasing power in the world of credit. My next guest is the 11th chairman and current board member for the National Credit Union Administration. Rodney previously served as Corporate Responsibility Manager for J.P. Morgan Chase, managing national partnerships with nonprofit organizations, financial regulators, and community stakeholders to promote financial inclusion and shared prosperity in underserved communities throughout the United States. Please give a warm welcome to Rodney Hood. Rodney, thank you for being on the show today. Thank you for inviting me. I'm delighted to be with you and to talk about the work that we're doing at the National Credit Union Administration. So thank you. I'm an honor. I'm honored. It's all our pleasure and our honor. There's a wealth of information and knowledge through over over your 30 year career that, you know, will go longer than 30 minutes, but we'll try to get as much uh, of that information as possible in the time that we have allotted today. Let me also just state that uh, this is your second time serving as a board member with the NCUA. I guess your first time was uh, 2005 to 2009 and then 2019 to 2021. So you've been involved a number uh, of years. So uh, obviously, that's a wealth of uh, knowledge and experience that we're looking forward to uh, learning about today. Well, Joe, I'm actually still here. So yes, I have been uh, a part of many of Wall Street's firms over the course of my professional career. And yes, mm-hmm. I was here at the NCUA from 2005 to nine. And then I went back to the private sector, back to Wall Street to do a lot of work in economic development and urban renewal and a lot of those types of activities. <laughs> then I came back. So yes, from 19 to 21, I was chairman and now I've rode into the seat of board member. So Great. just for your listeners, the National Credit Union Administration, we are the independent financial regulator and insurer for America's credit union system. So we are alongside the FDIC, uh, the LCC, the Federal Reserve, CFPB. We're all what we call financial regulators, but NCUA, our specific remit is overseeing the safety and soundness of our 4,800 credit unions that are now geographically located throughout the United States. We have roughly 135 million members of our credit unions today, Joe. So that's roughly one third of American households have credit union accounts. Assets approximate $2.2 trillion. And a number that I really am proud of is the fact that we have loans outstanding of about $1.5 trillion. So that means that the local credit unions that we're overseeing, they are making loans to their members, many of your listeners perhaps, who are needing loans for cars to go to and from work, the mortgages that they need for sustainable home ownership, and the loans that those budding entrepreneurs need for sustainable businesses. So $1.5 trillion covers a lot of those types of loan activities. And I know you all are doing also a lot of work with credit cards and payment rails, where credit unions offer a number of credit card products, and they want to be able to even make sure that their members have those tools available. So I'm delighted that you all are working daily in that space. And do you know that's something we encourage our credit unions to provide their members. And when I talk about some of the success, yes, I'm proud of the assets and the members and the loans, but I'm also proud of the capital. Our credit unions are better capitalized than they've been probably since the Great Recession of well over 15 years ago. So credit unions collectively have about 11 percent capital. And just for your listeners to know, we consider a credit union well capitalized if they have a ratio of 7 percent. So that's okay. 400 basis points beyond what we consider well capitalized. So just to know that we have a very strong and safe system. Okay, that's very, very uh, helpful. That being said, you were talking about the uh, the credit unions and lending to you, to the members. Uh, we're hearing a lot in the news today how community banks uh, are, you know, pulling back on lending uh, given the issues that are you know prevailing in the banking sector of late and a looming potential recession 
A lot of yeah. banks' uh, lending is drying up. Is the same thing taking place in the credit union space? Well, you know, that's a really good question, Joe. And right now, by all accounts, our credit unions are continuing to make credit available to their members. As I tell credit unions, you all are in the business of building trust. You're in the business of managing relationships. And it's because of that wonderful relationship that our institutions have with their members, or we call them member owners, they're able to really help navigate some of the headwinds that we see playing out. So, yes, I am looking at what some of the other banks are doing today uh, in response to some of the contagion we may have seen from Silicon Valley Bank, Signature Bank, First Republic, uh, even Credit Suisse to some degree. And in CUA, by a lot of the data that we're seeing, we've seen little to no contagion uh, from a lot of the big news event stories that you're seeing. Now, of course, we continue to monitor what's going on. All of our credit unions are insured by the NCUA. So just like the FDIC, when you have an account with us, you are insured up to $250,000 per account. We are also making sure that our members are structuring their accounts in a manner such that they don't have any funds that are uninsured. And that means what if we have 300,000? Well, that means that that 50,000 would not perhaps be insured. So we're now looking to see how do you structure your account such that all of your funds within a credit union carry the maximum insurance um, coverage. And we are doing a lot of education and outreach. More than 91% of our uh, accounts are fully insured. And that means that remaining 9%, those are prim primarily business owners. And they, of course, are looking at ways to restructure their accounts. So I want you to know that we're not seeing any uh, fallout from some of the headwinds that you've been reading about. In fact, we've seen an uptick in new members, new deposits. And with that coming, credit unions are practicing good balance sheet management. So, yes, we have seen rising interest rates. But in the midst of the rising interest rates, credit unions still have demand. So they are just what? making sure they're looking at duration risk. Are they structuring those loans appropriately? Are they helping liquidity management. So a lot of the things that perhaps other banks that you may have read about did not exercise and, and put forth, we are looking at risk mitigation and doing it head on. In fact, well, that's great. Let more, me ask you, you know, great overview uh, of the credit union. Why would someone become a member of a credit union? Because it's, it's new to me. I mean, I know what credit unions are, but I've never been a member of a credit union. You know, I have a local community bank. Mm -hmm. So you know, what's the main difference? Why should I potentially, you know, become a member of a credit union? What are the advantages over a community bank or the similarities and differences? Well, hey, Joe, I'm going to take a nuanced approach to answering your question, and I'll tell <laughs> you why. I'm the regulator. I'm the safety and soundness person right. whose sole job is just to make sure that there is a, a safe and sound system that I'm blessed to be one of the leaders of. So mm -hmm. I don't want to get into telling you where to take your money and place it in a bank or credit union. I just tell individuals that financial inclusion is important in today's society. Whether you go to a bank or credit union, just make sure you're dealing with a legitimate financial firm who is fully insured and backed by the U.S. government. So just want to let you know, I can't tell you where to go. But what no, I no, no, no. I got I you. I, I understand that. I was just trying to understand but the yes. difference between the two. Yes, the well, credit difference. unions are not-for-profit, little d, democratically controlled institutions. <laughs> Following the Great Depression, we had a number of individuals, these were the automobile workers, the manufacturing representatives. You all, they could not get traditional financing. So these were low to moderate income individuals just wanting to go to Main Street to get loans. And many of them could not get what we would call loans from a traditional bank. So what did they do? They galvanized. They reached into their pockets and they started lending money to each other. And that was the underpinning for today's credit union system that's now existed for about 100 years. So credit unions, I want to repeat, owned by the members. So for your $5, if you do decide to join a credit union, you not only become a member of that credit union, but you become uh, a shareholder that you can vote. So imagine for your $5, that gives you an opportunity to vote on the board and any of the policies that that credit union may have. Credit unions exist for the sole purpose of people helping people. That's their ethos. They grew out of adversity. They've been around for nearly 100 years in America. They date back a little longer than that, close to the 200 years when you think about their origins in Germany and then growing quickly in Canada. 
But today's system is still using those same tenants. You have to be a member of a credit union. Not everyone can go into the same credit union. So field of membership does matter. Uh, it also means that because credit unions are not for profit cooperatives, that means that when they have a banner year, they will share those loans savings with you, meaning a typical, for instance, let's say an auto loan at some places can be four, five, six percent, where the credit union loans are going to be a little lower than that by several percentage points because they share their profits with the members, Joe. And another piece that I love is when I will visit credit unions and they'll say, yes, we had such a bad year that our members woke up the next day to have an extra $500 or $1,000 in their account. Again, it's that sharing, it's that passing on the savings to members. So to go back to the root of your question, what's the difference? It's ownership that each person in the credit union has a membership stake. They get to be a part of the governance structure. They get to be a lot of a part of the things that really help enrich and sustain a lot of those local communities. And at the end of the day, I just am proud that credit unions are working alongside banks and community groups. Again, it's about helping uh, provide affordable financial services. So oh, that's very, uh, very helpful because that definitely answers my question. Uh, I, I thank you for that. Uh, jumping to your recent visit to the UK uh, in your remarks uh, at the UK Building Society Association Conference, you talked about the recent events in the U.S. banking crisis, if you want to call it a crisis. Uh, can you share your thoughts on today's issues that are taking place here in the U.S. banking industry uh, and your thoughts and outlook uh, going forward. Yes, Joe, I was in the United Kingdom and I was there at a building society conference and you all, what they call credit unions here in America, they refer to them as building societies in the United Kingdom and they also use credit unions, but their credit unions When I rattled off the trillions of dollars that our credit unions here are lending, their credit unions are doing a fraction of that, whereas their building societies tend to be a little bit more larger and they tend to be more akin to what we call credit unions here. So with that being said, I was in the UK to speak at an annual conference with the Bank of England and the Financial Conduct Authority where they wanted to hear my American perspective. Uh, The United States has probably the most sophisticated and robust credit union system around. So they wanted to glean some insight And Joe, they asked the same question that you asked. What are you doing as a regulator, given what just happened with Silicon Valley Bank and Signature and some of the others? And I called it not really a crisis, but I said it was a hiccup. And I said, I'm trying to prevent individuals from looking at what happened with those particular banks as um, being the same as what we experienced during the Great Recession. I was at the NCUA. 15 years ago when I was vice chairman, when we had the uh, mortgage-backed securities debacle. Mm -hmm. You all, what we saw play out then with the American economy, that was a crisis in capital. That was a crisis in collateral. That was a crisis in credit. What we're seeing play out today, at least in those early days of Silicon Valley Bank, that was a crisis in confidence. That is why you were seeing folks wanting to withdraw deposits and really fleeing for that next institution. So I'm trying to tell folks, let's not conflate what you saw uh, over a decade ago with what you were seeing playing out today. The tools that we have today that are available. We're looking at risk mitigation. We're looking at interest rate risk. We're looking at a number of tools. So I'm still very bullish about the future of the credit union system and also the overall uh, financial services system as we know it. I mean, having worked with Wall Street firms and now my role as a regulator, the data that I see, uh, it really does give me confidence that the American consumer is still paying their bills. They are still looking for loans when appropriate. And if there is going to be a tightening, I think that we can hopefully mitigate and navigate that to the degree that we can. But still, this is a safe system that's been resilient. I mean, if you look at some of the performance that you're seeing coming out from a lot of the credit unions that I oversee or reading the data from my peers, by all accounts, our American economy remains resilient and robust. And we do have the tools uh, in our arsenal regarding helping with liquidity, helping with capital adequacy. So that was the message that I was really wanting to instill in the uh, folks in the audience of the United Kingdom, because one of the main questions, Joe, they wanted to ask, well, what are you all going to do differently? Are you going to have some new onerous rules and regulations because of what just happened? And my approach to that question was, 
well, let's continue to study what transpired. Let's really make sure that we have a clear picture before we go out and start new regulations. Regulations. I'm of the opinion that regulation needs to be effective and not excessive. I can't have 4,800 credit unions that are so overregulated that they don't have the empowerment to lend that $1.5 trillion I just mm-hmm. made. So study is what I tell folks, and let's make sure that we're not going to be so hasty to come up with re- regulations. Because, by the way, Joe, there are already regulations that were in place by the bank regulators that perhaps were not followed. So mm-hmm. you're following what already exists as opposed to creating something else. We so would you it. say, so would you say that being said, cause I was talking about that recently with somebody, it was more of an isolated issue, if you will, to, to those handful of banks versus something that's more on a systemic level, because obviously you got Silicon Valley bank, you know, your first Republic, you know, uh, out uh, with the regulator on the West Coast, um, is, was it more lack of oversight or, you know, a more systemic at, at the particular bank, if you will, versus within the industry? I'm going to say isolated. I'm going to say a bit of an anomaly. I mean, mm-hmm. uh, the Silicon Valley bank model was a bit more nuanced in terms of their how they pretty much operated. And again, I'm not going to cast aspersions at any of my sure. other regulators because all of us who work in financial regulation, we live in glass houses, and I certainly wouldn't want them to throw stones at me, so I shan't throw any at them. But what I will say is that by nature of what we all have been reading, it turns out that there were perhaps some missteps when it came to looking at their balance sheets, looking at the duration between what we call hot money, that being the deposits that were being used to full of uh, uh, fuel, a lot of long term loans, uh, having securities that were uh, underwater. So perhaps not keeping up with the rising interest rate environment uh, with the alacrity that perhaps their guidelines would have dictated. So, again, I'm looking at it as isolated. I'm looking at it as nothing that really creates any systemic issues this time as we know it. Now, again, I don't want to get ahead of my skis and start speaking for the other regulators, but as someone who's looking at some of the same data, and I know at least for the institutions that I control, I can say that we've seen little to no contagion, credit units are operating on all cylinders, and again, capital is very high access to liquidity remains robust. So the one thing that I would applaud my fellow regulators in doing is that they were able to triage the situation. They took the necessary and deliberate steps to instill confidence. And I'm delighted that they've been able to really make it possible for those uh, those customers to still have access to affordable financial services. Okay, that's, uh, that's very helpful. The other concern we're hearing in the marketplace that hasn't materialized as of yet is uh, more the commercial real estate marketplace uh, with the rising rate environment that we've been under. A lot of these loans are going to be resetting, um, you know, in, in the you know coming year from historically low interest rates to, you know, uh, historically uh, higher interest rates in the last 20 years. Do you see that as a pending uh, issue uh, over the next uh, several quarters uh, in the real estate sector? You know what? That's something we've been hearing, Joe, for quite some time. And I do think the numbers do bear that out, that there are going to be some loans that are going to be resetting at much higher rates. Of the $1.5 trillion of loans that I've mentioned with credit unions, less than 4% of my credit union commercial real estate exposure is there on our books. So hmm. While we continue to look at it, credit unions tend to be more, I wouldn't say bread and butter, but more of the traditional financing. You're not seeing them doing a number of uh, what I would call the the really traditional commercial real estate. We think of buildings and apartment complexes and things of that nature. So they it's more, get it. It's more of the community, small businesses, homeowners versus commercial real estate. Exactly. How, how is the makeup of those loans in, in the um, credit union space? The makeup with this juncture is, I will just say that it's more one to four residential if they're seeing those on the investment side. Now, you will see some that are taking a loan participation and some of the more, I would call it, sophisticated type of lending products. But for the most part, our credit unions, I'm not going to say they're risk averse, but they stay within their lane. And that is they make the commercial loans. In fact, Joe, nowhere was that more apparent than during the pandemic with the Paycheck Protection Program. Our credit unions made over 310 
thousand PPP loans, and those are to small business owners for equipment, for inventory. Some of it is for um, perhaps expansion and things of that nature. But again, as we talk about the commercial real estate, and you know, I don't know if you've been traveling around the country as much as I've been, but there are a lot of empty buildings. There are a lot of, I would say, a lot of the franchise. Um, companies, you know, with restaurants and things that I'm seeing signs that are completely vacant. So I do worry about what that pretends for the overall strength of the economy. Uh, but for, again, the lane that I can control with our credit unions is less than 4%. And with them, we're going to make sure that they are structuring their loans appropriately. The capital is there. The least loan loss reserves accounts are being fully funded. So again, we're bracing ourselves for the future. Great. Thank you for that. You said you have 4,800 credit unions throughout the country, and obviously you have regulators all through. Is the, is the breakup of regulators similar to the FDIC? How, do, how does that work in terms of the regulators and how they're geographically diversified and how many regulators oversee all 4,800 credit unions? That's a good question, Joe. So NCUA, the National Credit Unit Administration, we are the prudential regulator and insurer. We have a little over 1,050 employees our main headquarters is right outside of Washington, D.C., where we have um, our headquarters in Alexandria, Virginia. And then we have two regional offices, and we have them in Tempe, Arizona, and in Austin, Texas. So there we have regional managers that in turn have what I call the examiners. Look at them as the foot soldiers. They are the ones who every day of the week, they're working with a different credit unit around their exam, their safety and soundness, and looking at how they are uh, really keeping their uh, operation safe and sound. Joe, you're giving me a good segue. So I'm talking about what we do as the federal regulator and insurer. Mm -hmm. date, all 50 states have their own uh, state credit unions as well. So while there are some instances where I may not be the main regulator for like a state credit union, I'm there insurer. So that means that we at NCUA, we work with all 50 states to go through the dual examination. We'll go with them and work on the exam parameters and requirements. Uh, we train them on things that we care about, like cybersecurity, data protection, data privacy. So Wonderful question that you've raised, because I want you to know it's not just NCUA doing this unilaterally, but it is also in collaboration with the states. And similar to the FDIC, they also have state chartered banks, but who still use the FDIC for its insurance. So wanted to let you know that we are all unique in that we have folks that cover the whole country. But again, state chartered groups work with us. So that means that that state bank supervisor is working with the NCUA person when it comes to those local institutions. Now, as I mentioned in the opening of our show, you know, Supernet, we're building the rails for credit cards in the banking sector, banking, including credit unions. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about the acceptance of cannabis banking with your credit union you, you, the unions and the members to date, how many credit unions have a cannabis program and where do you see that, you know, going, uh, you know, forward and your views on, on cannabis banking? Joe, I'm going to answer that. And again, a little nuance. I sure. want there to be more opportunities for cannabis banking. And people ask me, Rodney, you are a safety and soundness regulator. What <laughs> you and your listeners may not know is that I almost became a priest. I was a missionary well before going into banking with Wall Street companies. I lived in Zambia and Zimbabwe thinking I was going to become a, an Episcopal priest. And when that didn't happen, I went into financial services. And a lot of the work I've done in banking and now with NCUA, it's all around helping marginalized, underserved communities. So, Joe, my whole career has helped provide home ownership for the marginalized, helping those entrepreneurs who are typically denied credit. How did we do that through community development and community reinvestment? So I got involved with cannabis banking when I was visiting a group in Napa Valley, and they told me about how they were getting ready to get their dream home, the wife and husband had saved, and then the moment of truth occurred. They applied for the mortgage. The mortgage was approved initially, but then when they realized that the couple, one of them worked for a cannabis business, which by the way, it's legal medically and whatnot in California, but 
they were denied the mortgage because the bank said, we don't deal with those types of businesses. So I, when I talk about helping the underserved and less fortunate, I am grouping cannabis businesses into that category and people who work there. So that's why I, in wanting to help make a difference, I have taken it upon myself. As you know, I've spoken at many cannabis conferences about the need for reform, the need for not treating cannabis as it's this this awful product when it's legal in about 39 states now. I was very pleased to see that Minnesota has taken it to their their legislature. So, Mm -hmm. yes, cannabis banking is something that I am encouraging credit unions to work with because if you don't give them the legitimate rails that these providers need, we're going to continue to have it under operating under a black market or a cloud. But we have our 4,800 credit unions, there are about 250 that are actively engaged in working with the cannabis businesses. That means that they're working with their deposits. They're working with them around the cash and the storage. Now, of course, they need to adhere to everything that we do around the BSA, Bank Secrecy Act. Are they making sure that they're completing the appropriate number of currency transaction reports, suspicious activity reports when warranted? And it's important that the credit unions that are engaging in this business understand the risk profiles. And I'm telling them you can't do this just because you think that it's the thing that that's going to help you drive profits. You need to do this if you are going to invest in hiring the folks who have the expertise that are going to follow the Treasury guidance and guidelines. So of the 250 that now have it, I've already told you we have 4,800 credit. So there's a, a lot of opportunity for others to to join in this. And today, when we work with those credit unions and the exams, NCUA has never to date closed down a single credit union because of their cannabis program. If they're following the protocols and if they also are making sure that those funds are coming in or taxable, traceable and transparent, we want to see more because, again, I'm promoting financial access. I want financial inclusion and I'm not going to be one of those that's going to pick and choose who gets to be financial included. So the cannabis businesses are important. They are stimulating the economy and I'm not going to put them against anyone else. So so that's enthusiastic. That's 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 great. Uh, And that's very helpful. So that kind of leads me. It's a good segue that you just gave me going back to your uh, your remarks over in the UK talking about how finance as a creative force. Mm-hmm. I would I would have to say, and maybe you can expand, this is another tool in the toolbox, uh, having a cannabis banking program to help the uh, underserved communities or just the communities at large who are members of this particular uh, credit union. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, finance as a creative force? Maybe we can expand on that, given that we're talking about, you know, uh, trying to under, you know, help the underserved communities? Exactly, Joe. And that's the reason I talk about finance as a force for good. I talk about helping people, helping marginalized, helping them have a future. And what I talked about in the UK, I've talked about how we tend to only hear the stories about the banks that are not following their risk profile rules. We hear about those bank boards where right before there's a collapse that the board maybe gives themselves bonuses or extra stock options that have been sold on the market before the collapse. And it leaves a lot of people wondering what's going on in finance. And especially, Joe, the young people, they, they hear these stories. As you know, a lot of the Gen Zs and millennials and those groups, they want to work with mission purpose groups, people who really care about making a difference. So a lot of the speech, when I talk about finance as a force for good, I'm saying get those stories out of your minds for the moment, if you will, and think about how it's credit unions and banks alike who are providing financial literacy or helping that family who's never had a home before save and get the appropriate mortgage, not just for this generation, but for the next generation. That budding entrepreneur who's had a business plan, but just needed someone to sit down with him or her and talk about how do you get the capital that you need to have a business? Those are things that small credit unions have been able to do. What about the fact that when we talk about helping uh, the underserved, disabled and dis ability communities, they also want access to financial services. I read a study from the FDIC that 60% of households with disabilities could not obtain $400 uh, in the event of a family emergency. So what are we doing at NCUA? We're continuing to let individuals know that we need to bring disabled populations into our credit unions. What we're doing at NCUA 
we are now recruiting at schools that have individuals with disabilities. One such school, Joe, outside of our office in Alexandria and Gal Gadot, uh, in D.C., it's a school for the deaf and hard of hearing. So we are now hiring students. They may be deaf and hard of hearing, but we can make the necessary accommodations to bring them to work with us. These are accountants. These are engineers. So these are folks that we are seeing. Finance can be that port in the storm as a force for good. And I'm so afraid, Joe, that so few people hear the stories uh, like I've just shared with you. So that's why whenever I get a, a platform, I talk about finance force for good. That's those are the types of examples that I like to share. Oh, that's great. That's helpful. And I'm going to ask another question. Uh, I, I'm listening to you and I'm thinking and I'm learning so much about credit unions uh, of the 4,800. And how many new credit unions open up on an annual basis? Is it you know as difficult as opening a bank? Are you seeing more credit unions, or can you talk a little bit about the, the process and uh, if they're continuing to expand? Yes, Joe. Just as is important for me to oversee the safety of the four thousand eight hundred, I also want to see de novo or new credit unions. In fact, we've had six new credit unions open this year. I was able to present. Uh, a, a credit union charter to one of those new credit unions is called the Members Only Credit Union. I was with them in Philadelphia. Uh, that is an African-American sorority uh, who just started their own credit union. It's going to be a digital native uh, credit union. So that means they can cover their entire country. Just last week, there is an Episcopal church uh, in the Bronx of New York City that just opened its doors to a credit union. Just a few months ago in Lame Deer, Montana, there is a tribal land where the tribal leaders and the Native American group got together and started a credit union. So, yes, we are seeing de novo or new institutions just before our call today. I didn't even know that you were going to ask me this, but I was meeting with some of the folks who handle charters uh, for credit unions. So we're looking at how do we expedite the process? It takes anywhere from 12 to 18 months. How do we talk about the capital requirements that are needed, building out your board, doing the research? So we're looking to streamline the process. We're looking to have other folks create institutions. I mean, yes, it's nice to have the ones we have, but I think if we want to have an industry that's growing and vibrant, we need to welcome new credit union. So we've done just that. And who knows, Joe, perhaps for the next time I see you or come on your show, maybe I can tell you that we've had six more to join. But it's so important to have a vital ecosystem of new and old credit unions. Cool. That's very helpful, Rodney. Uh, Now, I just want to jump going over some of the other speeches you've been involved with and conferences you've attended. I guess you were recently at the the Trellance Annual Conference. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Yes, and, I was with you uh, last week. Right. And in your Florida remarks Florida. and in your remarks at the conference, you said you are bullish on fintech. OK, can you expand on what you mean? You are bullish on fintech for our listeners. Yes, Joe, I'm bullish on fintech because financial technology is what's driving today's financial marketplace. When you think about the consumers, think about you and me. I mean, we're probably using remote deposit capture. We're using expedited bill payments. We're doing all these things. And if credit unions are going to be able to compete and really serve as 21st century institutions, I want them to be armed with all of the new tools and products that are coming from whether it be Silicon Valley or Silicon Alley, I think is a new term that I've heard. So Trellance, I was talking about the important role that that data aggregation plays is what Trellance was doing. They were getting all these data aggregators and their products in place to say, how can you make a loan decision within maybe three minutes? And yes, you heard that three minutes. How do you use data analytics to go deeper and making sure that your customer, in our case, credit union member, that you're able to be there as a part of their life journey, meaning from the time that person gets out of college, gets his or her first car, then they're home, then they're married. How do you make sure that you're using data appropriately to to have products tailored to that individual person? So I love the fact that technology is so important, that credit unions are using fintech partnerships. I see the value in technology so much, Joe, that I've gone from looking at it as a luxury pre-COVID to now looking at it as an imperative. Credit unions, if they're going to compete and hold on to those members, they need to evolve with all the tools that are out there. I look at this so passionately that I recently created, uh, with the help of my fellow board members, we have a new office of financial technology and access at NCUA. We've been looking for a person to oversee that group for about three years. And 
it took three years because I wanted the right person. I wanted someone who was innovative, imaginative, who also knew policy and regulations. And by George, I'm glad to say that we found that person. He started with us in January of this year and has already hit the ground running. He's going to be doing things for us, such as tech sprints. He's going to do Shark Tank-like events, but we'll get a group of social entrepreneurs together. And then we will sort of have a contest to see which best idea is going to germinate well. So technology, bullish about it. In fact, one of the things that I'm having to say now, I used to always say in the speeches, the future of finance is around financial technology. No, that future is here. If you don't embrace those tools to date, I don't even know if I'd have an industry to regulate in the years to come. We have to stay ahead of the curve. Technology is changing so rapidly that, you know, in many instances, I mean, Technology is a, a bedrock, a foundation to any institution's uh, success, I would say. Would you agree? I would agree wholeheartedly. It is the bedrock. It's fundamental building block. And again, the Silicon Valley and all the social entrepreneurs, they're not waiting for uh, regulators to keep up or to catch up. So that's why we need to have programs similar to what we've just created. And then, Joe, I will say this. When NCUA did roll out our fintech office, we are now – working alongside other financial regulators. That means the FDIC has its own office of innovation, the OCC, CFPB, C, um, CFTC. So a number of the groups uh, within Washington regulatory um, settings are all looking at innovation. Again, it used to be considered a luxury. I now look at it as a strategic imperative. Okay. So it'd be fair to say that in order to attract that Gen Z and millennials, you have to embrace technology because as we know, Gen Z and the millennials are all about the apps and, you know, Zelle and Venmo. And mm -hmm. so, I, I mean, can you talk a little bit about the membership base, you know, the, the, the average age? I mean, is it a young base? Is it a you know, middle age base? Uh, I would imagine, you know, maybe it's middle age, but how do you bring in the Gen Z and the millennials, I guess, through technology? Yes, of course, it's through technology, but also, Joe, it's through that whole people helping people ethos. As I may have mentioned earlier, when I talk about finance as a force for good, when those Gen Z folks and the millennials, when they hear that credit unions are mission driven, purpose driven, when they hear that these are D, little d, democratically controlled institutions, when they hear that, as not-for-profits, credit unions are able to then differentiate themselves from other financial services providers. So when I talk about that 135 million members, about 6 million of them have, over the past three years at the onset of the pandemic, and I think it's because they saw the news stories about credit unions helping each other. They saw how they've always been able to be there when their members need them the most. And I think that's what we're seeing with a lot of the young folks is that they look at credit unions as purpose-driven, people-oriented first, relationship-centered. And I think that's what we're, what we're seeing. And I love that. That's great for recruiting uh, these individuals to work with some of the credit unions or more not notably for them to join. Who knows? Even work with us at NCUA. So that's why I'm just excited that they, the credit unions remain tethered to their purpose and mission. Okay, that's uh, that's very uh, very informative. I appreciate. And I um, wish I had data though regarding the age span, as you could imagine. So a lot of the credit unions themselves, that the membership base does tend to skew. I would say fifty plus. But again, with a lot of the college campuses and other groups that are, have credit unions, and Joe, I didn't mention that of the. 4,800 credit unions that we have, most of the college universities have credit unions affiliated with them. So that means that when I was just recently in uh, Madison, Wisconsin, where there is a university credit union, there's uh, another credit union at Auburn. So a lot of those credit unions, because they're on the campuses, like I was at Duke uh, near my home in North Carolina. So the credit unions that are serving the collegiate communities, they also have been able to demonstrate their mission. And again, that's another catalyst for getting some of those young members and not just is that a is that a large market uh you know i i went to syracuse back in the day and i i don't recall there being a uh, syracuse university you know credit union but i remember back in the day mbna was the big credit card company that was white labeling for all universities how, how many credit unions are on university campuses across the nation because that would be a huge market opportunity it sounds like 
the last count, when I spoke at the Educational Credit Union Conference, there are about 100. Okay, so that, that, that's a significant opportunity to, to grow in that, in that segment of the market. Exactly. And since you've already asked me about de novos or new credit union charters, who's to say you can't go back for your alumni chapter at Syracuse and say, hey, why, are, why don't we have our own credit union? Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Absolutely. Okay, that's uh, that's very informative. I'm learning a lot today, Rodney, and I appreciate that. And I hope our listeners, and I'm sure our listeners are as well. Thanks for listening to the Freedom to Buy podcast presented by Supernet. And thank you to Rodney Hood, the 11th chairman of the NCUA and board member. Uh, you can get more information on Supernet at supernet.ai. You can listen to past episodes of Freedom to Buy on Cannabis Radio on Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, and Spotify, as well as Google Podcasts. And Rodney, for our listeners, can you give some, you know, how can our listeners learn more about the NCUA and, you know, the features and benefits of membership? What a good question and a nice ending to our great dialogue today, Joe. Please go to our website. It's ncua.gov. And again, that's the National Credit Union Administration, ncua.gov. You will hear about a lot of our tutorials, a lot of the information that we have regarding what's going on with the credit unions, what's going on in your specific state. Also, there is a whole section devoted to mycreditunionfinder.gov. So you can type in where you live and it can help you uh, find credit unions that you can perhaps consider uh, there in your local community. Uh, we have a lot of information about deposit insurance. How do you make sure that you're using the tools to calculate your limits appropriately? So again, we want to inform you. We want to equip you to be just really effectively engaged in the American economy. And I've enjoyed my time with you today and hope you all have been able to learn a little bit more about the credit union system and the role it plays uh, in the American economy. I think our listeners most certainly learned a lot today because I know that I did, Rodney, and I truly appreciate you uh, coming on the show. And we look forward to having you back in the future uh, where we can keep on talking for hours and hours with all the knowledge that you have amassed over the years. So once again, thank you for your time. Thank you for our listeners. And we will talk to you soon. The opinions expressed on this CannabisRadio.com program are those of the guests and hosts and do not necessarily reflect those of the staff and management of CannabisRadio.com. Any rebroadcast, republication, or retransmission of this program without proper consent is prohibited.